So I want you to know that your biggest assumption about God is wrong. Now, I am making an assumption about what your biggest assumption is, but as a pastor, I have lots of conversations with lots of different people, and over and over and over again, um, a, a significant aspect, belief, assumption about who God is and what God is like comes up, regardless of whether someone's been a follower of Jesus for decades or they're just kicking the tires on this whole Jesus thing. I would suggest that this misassumption is so pervasive and so universal um, that it finds its way not just into all sorts of expressions of religion, but in all sorts of expressions of the Christian faith. And here it is. It is that God, at his core, is a contract God, a karmic God, that God will respond to you and your good behavior or your bad behavior, your good belief or your bad belief with blessing or with judgment. This is the assumption that I feel like we all carry about who God is and what God is like. And no matter how much we seem to encounter Jesus of Nazareth, this assumption rears its ugly head in our subconscious and our expressed faith in God. There are a number of you here this morning who are in the midst of some form of a spiritual evolution. Call it deconstruction, call it transformation, call it formation, call it whatever you want. But things that you held on to with certainty, things that were so black and white to you maybe five years ago, now all of a sudden you've either rejected wholesale or have at least come into serious question. For many of you, these were things that were central pillars of your faith, dogmatic expressions of what hell was or the women's role in the church or sexuality, things that you were certain about you might not be so certain about anymore. Things you knew for sure, you now wonder about. I think for many of you, the, the pain and unsettling nature of asking these sorts of questions comes with the question of, what does God think about my doubt? What does God think about my questioning? How does God feel about my newfound faith in whatever? So I want to acknowledge that while this might be a liberating step in your faith, while this might be a necessary step in what we would call maturity, I want to acknowledge that it's often painful, and it's also often very unsettling. You don't quite know what to grab a hold of, where to place an anchor. I think if we go back and we reflect on the faith that many of us grew up in, we realize that what was so attractive about a conservative fundamentalist faith was one of certainty that it handed us answers to problems, to questions that we had. Um, in fact, this is the world where you may have heard this, that the Bible is basic instructions before leaving earth. Got a problem? Crack the Bible open. It'll solve your problem for you. We had black and white answers. Some of you are familiar with this, um, this appeal to certainty, this formula that ensured a certain result. Many of you, this is a foreign concept. But life is harsh enough and real enough and raw enough, and God is God, that at this point, many of you have bumped up against, I tried the thing, I, I plugged in X, Y, and Z, and I did not get the result that I was promised. So whether it was how to order a godly household so that your kids turned out a certain way, my goodness, I have a three-year-old, and does that hit home? <laughs> Maybe it was that you could pray in such a way so that you could find healing. And if you didn't find healing, it's because the way you prayed was broken. You need to try again or believe harder. Or maybe it was, hey, look, if you believe this sort of way or study this Bible in this sort of way, you will achieve spiritual maturity or maybe even salvation or the assurance of it. The, con the common denominator in all of this is a one-size-fits-all program of certainty. Do you want to know? Then follow my plan. Problem, solution. A contract God. A karmic God. Today we're beginning 12 weeks 
in a series on the minor prophets. And this might be a terrible idea, because 12 weeks, if for those of you who are, are about as good at math as I am, uh, you realize it's a quarter of the year. And this is a section of the book, or a section of the, the Old Testament and the, the Bible that you're like, I don't know. I've never studied Hezekiah before. And see, I just caught you because Hezekiah is not even one of the minor prophets. And about two-thirds of you were like, yeah, no, I've never read that one. I don't know what Joel's about. I have no idea what Obadiah is on about. Yes, those are both actual ones. What is this dark corner of the scriptures? What does it have to say to us? What does it have to say about God? What does it have to say about who we are as his people? I think for those of us who are challenged with this newfound doubt, these newfound questions, this uh, lack of certainty, I think you will find both a lot of really hard things to grapple with, so I'm going to put some more on your plate. But beyond that, my hope is that you'll find, oh wow, the God that I actually believe in, that I'm grappling with, that is wrestling with me, is the God that I've known all along. It actually is Jesus of Nazareth. That's my prayer for us, that our imaginations would be stirred and our souls would be filled with hope in the God who makes all things new through Jesus. We will want clarity, but the prophets are going to offer us obscure metaphors. We're going to want some sort of formula, and they're going to serve up contradiction. God says this, and then he says this, all in the same book, complete opposites. It's beautiful. I will destroy you. I will not destroy you. We'll want data, and yet these prophets are only ever going to insist on a God who desires to see us and know us. In this way, I pray that we are stirred and that God will speak to us in these words and that we will go in order And so I want to encourage you to to read them. So we're in Hosea this week. It's 14 chapters. It's not super long. So if you want to catch up, you can read a couple chapters a day, get caught up by the weekend. And then next Sunday, we're going to be in Joel, two chapters long. You can knock it out in 10 minutes before church. But read them. Sit with them. Don't read them to mine their data. Let them mine your soul. What stands out to you? What's strange to you? What do you uh, kind of recoil at? The prophet Hosea is a prophet speaking to the northern kingdom of Israel. And I would love to go into like a 45-minute lecture about this, but I'm really, I told the the crew this morning as we were praying, I pray the Holy Spirit restrains me. I can geek out on some Old Testament, y'all. But a little bit of context, because context is important. The 12 prophets are collected as a whole called the Book of the Twelve or the Twelve. So you have the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and then you have the 12. Now, some people see these as 12 different prophets, but I think these were compiled and edited and redacted in such a way that they were meant to tell a cohesive story from beginning to end. I don't think it's an accident that the message of Hosea is the leading message, the gateway into these 12 prophets. And so Hosea Around the 8th century BC, after King Solomon had died, Israel is torn by civil war, and it divides into two kingdoms. There's the southern kingdom, which was Judah, where Jerusalem was, and then there's the rest of it, the northern kingdom, known as Ephraim. So if you see Ephraim in your prophets, that's what it's talking about, also known as Israel. The northern part of Israel had devolved into various forms of idolatry. They were worshiping the Baals or Baal, or Asherah, and that's Baal's consort. I would love to go into the colorful colorful details as to what that looked like and what they were trying to get Baal to do. I will let you Google that. Make sure your safe search is on. But what they wanted was they wanted Baal's blessing and flourishing. Uh, You would worship him to get good crops and more kids and so that your cows would not miscarry, but have more cows. It's prosperity. And then politically, they were depending on their army, and they were making political alliances with Egypt, who was to their south, 
west and Assyria, who's to their north. And there they stood between these two empires and the means for these two empires to wage war against each other. And so Israel tries to play off of these two empires and gain from this political savvy. All of this, Hosea speaks strongly against. As they begin to depend on other gods for their provision, and they begin to depend on other empires and their military might and their kings for protection. In short, what Israel was doing was looking outside of Yahweh, the God of Israel, for the things that only God promised to provide them. And so on its face, Hosea calls Israel to return, to repent, that famous word from church, back to its love for Yahweh. The God who redeemed and made Israel and all that Israel is, Hosea asked Israel to go back to the God who provides, re-enter into his love before being devoured by his judgment. But on closer inspection, what we find is that this is not the primary message of Hosea. That there are these anchor points, these pillars where God breaks through and gives the game away where God says, yeah, yeah, I know I'm going to judge you, but uh, I can't help but love you. And so this is captured most clearly in this weird story that begins the book, where God shows up to the prophet Hosea and says, hey, got a ministry opportunity for you. I want you to go find this woman who is either a prostitute or is at least associated with prostitution, and I want you to marry her. Now, here's the deal. She's going to sleep around on you like gangbusters. It's going to be great. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and love her anyways, and right, so the the story goes on. You're going to have three kids by this woman. Are they your kids? Are they not? I don't know. Who's to say? You'll never know, right? The first one you're going to name Jezreel, which is in Hebrew is Yisrael, which is a play off of Yisrael, right? So there's this poetic wordplay that the Hebrews get into that's really beautiful. And I say, I'm not going to do it. Y'all are pulling me in. I'm not going to do it. And this is associated with a place where this general, uh, Jehu, goes in and he slaughters this army in order to secure Israel's political Thing. So if you're, if you're into like uh, Game of Thrones, House of Dragons sort of thing, like whatever you're picturing there, yep, this is what Jehu is doing. This is the story in the Old Testament where Jehu takes Jezebel, who's the queen, uh, the illegitimate queen of Israel, and he, in the name of God, throws her out of the window and lets dogs uh, eat her carcass. Go God, I guess? I don't know, right? So that's Jezreel. <laughs> so this is the location where God says, I am going to have this firstborn. I want you to name him Jezreel because it is Israel's violence that is about to be revisited upon them. It's also this same place that if you paid attention in our scripture reading this morning, God said, and I will take Jezreel and I will make it a place of hope, a place of peace. Hosea has another kid by Gomer, his wife, and this child's name is Lo Ruchama. You say it with me? Just kidding. You don't have to. You'll spit on your neighbor. It's not cool. So Lo, Lo Ruchama is, uh, it means no compassion or no pity, probably most closely. And our, I think our English translations are a little bit shy. They don't want to quite go there. Is you're not loved. And this child's name will be not loved because God has removed his love from his people. And then the last child is lo ami. And it means you are not my people. And so the the picture here is that the prophet marries a woman and they bear, the, the fruit of their marriage is violence, unlovedness, and a, a, a violation of being God's people. The point is that Israel's infidelity to Yahweh has resulted in the birth of a new reality. One, not characterized by the covenant of God, not characterized by the love of God, not characterized by the blessings and provisions of God, but characterized by the result of that infidelity, of their idolatry. You want to trust Assyria? Go right ahead. Trust Assyria. You want to worship Baal? Go right ahead. And so we hear God's judgment, and 
Hosea talks about God's judgment as this active thing. But if you pay close attention, what God gives to Israel is the results of their removing themselves from covenant relationship with God. And so in this way, the judgment in Hosea is the judgment of a people who do not believe they are loved by God, and so then live as if they are not loved by God. And they reap the whirlwind that they sow. You with me there? I am not God's beloved, and so the ramifications, the consequences of that are, I will now live as if I am not God's beloved. Who do I need to go to to get protection? Who do I need to to, to conquer in order to gain. I don't trust God. I trust the army. I don't trust God. I trust Assyria. I don't trust God. I trust the Baals or the Asherah. I trust the Canaanite deities because God surely doesn't care for me. So this judgment is tied directly to the consequences of their abandoning of God. Now, As we're introduced to the prophets, if you've not read them, they are scathing poets, right? So think of some artists that you know, the tortured souls that they are, right? This is the prophets, but with all of the world's problems heaped upon their shoulders. And in their prophecies, they are going to speak poetically. They're going to use metaphor. And they're going to serve up images that evoke a response. We would do well to be careful about taking a one-to-one correlation because you're going to get into problems really, really quickly. I will destroy you, says the Lord, and then six verses later, and I swear I will never destroy you, says the Lord. Here's a great example. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Hosea chapter 4, verse 3. And I love this because uh, so much of what happens when we encounter these prophets is, and this is not a judgment on us, it's just a fact, we are largely ignorant of the Old Testament. And so the prophets who are steeped in the Old Testament are going to use all sorts of Old Testament alliteration and callbacks, like a good Marvel movie. (laughs) Chapter 4, verse 3, here's part of God's judgment on Israel. Therefore, the land will mourn, and all of its inhabitants will perish. The wild animals, the birds of the sky, and even the fish of the sea will perish. We're thinking, man, that's intense. God's going to kill all the land, all the dirt is going to die, and then all the people are going to die, and then all like the cows are going to die, and then all the birds are going to die. Like, we must be talking about nu- nuclear warfare, right? This is God's future prediction of the atom bomb. That's what's happening here, right? It's not the way you should ever read the prophets. Please don't do it that way. If you pay close attention and you are familiar with Genesis, this is the story of Genesis told backwards. Go, Abraham, into the land that I will give to you, and I will make you a great people, and I will fill that land with your children. That land will be barren. Those people will be no more. And now we're back at the beginning of Genesis, and God created the land, and he filled it with what? Animals. He's now taking the animals out of the land. And God created the skies, and he filled it with what? The birds. And so now God is taking the birds out of the skies. And God created the waters, and he fills the waters with fish. And God is taking the fish out of the skies. This is a condemnation of uncreation. It is the result of leaving the God of love, the God who made you, who created you, who sustains you, It is severing yourself from goodness itself. Augustine describes this as evil. And he uses this analogy of rot in a tree. When we separate ourselves from the goodness of God or from God's self, we immediately begin to die. We immediately begin to decay. We immediately begin to become this deconversion, uncreated thing. This is what's being described here. It does not necessarily mean that there will, you won't find a squirrel. I don't think they have squirrels there. but So yes, there will be a lot of death. The Assyrians will come in. They will conquer Israel. This is what Hosea is predicting. And they will enter into some form of uncreation. 
Hosea 1 verse 8 makes this really clear. When he says that you are not my people and I am not your God. Again, if you're familiar with Israel, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, this is a stark condemnation on these people. But it's important to remember that these are, in fact, metaphors. And as strong as they might be, we have to be careful that we hold them in the context that they are written in, and that we hold them in tension with the other promises and proclamations found within Hosea and the rest of the scriptures. And so the question for Israel is, will you be loved by God or won't you? And this is the ultimate judgment, that Israel did not believe they were loved, and thus they behaved as if they weren't. And God's judgment is God stepping back and saying, if that's the world you want to live in, here it is. So God gives them what they want. God says to his people, if you don't want to be my people any longer, fine, you are no longer my people. If you don't want to be my beloved anymore, fine, you are no longer my beloved. In other words, at least in Hosea, God's judgment has a passive note to it. It is not God's, uh, I don't know, throat punch to the people of Israel, but rather God letting the consequences of their actions have its way. Now, a big part of this is found in some of the language that Hosea is going to use and the minor prophets are going to use. It's called a, a rib case, R-I-B. So you'll find it in this like English phrase. I have a cause against you or I have this against you is how it's translated. But this is a technical legal word that's used in their world to take up a legal dispute between like a suzerain vassal lord over the, the person under him, right? So think feudalism. This is a lord talking to the, I don't know, whatever they're called, vassal and saying like, hey, I've got this problem with you. You have broken this contract. Now, the problem with this way of thinking is, right, this is God condescending God's self to them and speaking to them in a way that they would understand. What we do is we work backwards and we take this historical contextual language and then we try to import it into 2024. And that's going to be really problematic and it's going to lead you to this sort of thinking. If I do this, then God will do this. It will also require you to cut off sections of Hosea where God seems to say otherwise. And so there's some comfort in a God like this, in a contract God. When we have the answers to the questions, we get to be in control. I get to know my standing before a God who has a list of rules that if you do this, then you're in, and if you do this, you're out. We can control this God, and maybe more importantly, we can be left alone by this God. He's given us his rules. Ah, we followed the rules. Now just leave us alone, please. While the dangers of this contract God way of thinking are really obvious in some conservative fundamentalist circles, we must remember that to step across the aisle and adopt a fundamentalist spirit with a different set of certainties is no better. That you are, in fact, still a fundamentalist. <laughs> Maybe putting it this way, the problem with conservative fundamentalism is not that it has the wrong answers to the problems or to the questions, though this might be the case. The problem is that it assumes God is a contract God. It assumes that you can control God and control your standing before God by doing certain behaviors. And hopefully this is beginning to sound familiar. If you grew up in youth group at all, this was basically the whole deal. Hey, God really loves you and just really needs you to behave so he can keep loving you. I paraphrase. <laughs> the problem with any sort of fundamentalism, regardless of whether it's progressive or conservative or whateverism, is that it assumes we are in control. Your biggest assumption about God is that you are in control of God. So we see this sort of theology at work in Christian nationalism. If you'll allow me this brief detour, 
You might be familiar with this verse from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Ignoring the ripping this out of context, applying it to the United States, when in reality this was a verse to the people of Israel, we'll ignore that for a second. Can we actually get at the more problematic part of this? If you do this, then I will do this. Is that how God works? Are you sure? Christian nationalism is built on the theology that if we could only do this, then the glory of God will fill this nation. You know who believes that in the New Testament? It's the Pharisees. If we can just be righteous enough, the kingdom of God will come here in this place. Jesus reserves his strongest condemnation for those people. If I do this, then my kids will do this. If I do this, then my spouse will do this. If I do this, then my roommate has to do this. If I do this, then God will have to bless me. If I do this, then I'll be successful. If I just do this, I'll be happy. This is our biggest assumption about God that is absolutely wrong because it's an assumption that it's dependent on you. We assume that because we have, fill in the blank, God will, fill in the blank, and we place ourselves over God in control of God and then over others, and we control them with our Bible verses and our theology and our behavior programs. And this is what the heart, at the heart of the Old Testament describes as idolatry. Pull these levers, and then God will show up and dance for you. And it reduces God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who came down and was born in a manger, the God who we tried to nail down and kill, but who was raised up by the Spirit of God. It reduces him to some formula, to some rubric. So if I want a different output from God, I just need to change my inputs. Or maybe to put it more plainly, if I really want God to love me, then maybe I should just pray more. Read my Bible more. Behave better. And in the end, it's a theology that looks at what we can get from God, what God can do for us, without God's self. But God is love. And God is relentless. And despite our assumptions about God, God commits himself to us and relentlessly pursues us. And as much as we may think God is dependent on us loving him back, how we perform, he is not. Hear the words of Hosea himself. Hosea chapter 3, verse 1. To the same people that he has just condemned, has just uncovenanted himself with. The Lord said to me, go show love to your wife again, Hosea. Even though she loves another man and continually commits adultery. Because in the same way, the Lord loves the Israelites, although they turn to other gods and love to offer raisin cakes to idols. That's your real problem, y'all. Y'all are eating raisin cakes. It's the real judgment this morning. Or maybe that's not enough. Go to Hosea chapter 6. Man, Hosea describes God as a roaring lion who like devours the carcass of Israel. It's dark. (laughs) But then God shows up as the, the lion who fights for Israel later in the prophecy. And so if you keep reading, all of a sudden the God you thought you knew becomes like this really redemptive and beautiful God. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3, the second half of it. God will come to our rescue as certainly as the appearance of the dawn. So question, what good behavior, what prayer, what Bible study did you do to make the sunrise this morning? As surely as the dawn, God will rescue us because that's just what God does. 
As certainly as the winter rain comes, as certainly as the spring rain that waters the land, God will restore us. So I know this because the fullest, clearest revelation of God is not found in Hosea. It's not even found in the Bible. The clearest and fullest revelation of God is found in the person of Jesus Christ. And for Hosea and for Jesus, salvation is not found in what you do. But it's in what God has done and is doing and will do for you. Our relationship with God is not based on your love for him. I invite you to love God. You were created to love God. Having an awareness of God's love for you and loving him back is deeply human. That is not dependent on your standing with God. Our relationship with God is based on God's love for us. Full stop. Period. Okay. Look at chapter 2, verse 14. I'm going to go through this quickly, but I want you to see Israel's responsibility in all of this. In the future, I will woo you. I will lead her back into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. I will give her back her vineyards to her. I will turn the valley of trouble into an opportunity of hope. I will remove the names of the Baal idols from your lips so that you will never utter their names again. I will do that for you. I will respond. I will commit myself. I will commit myself. I will commit myself to you, he says two or three times. I can't remember. And I will plant you in my own, as my own in the land. Your salvation, Israel, is dependent on me. And I will love on not loved. And I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people. And we will all say, you are our God. The God revealed in Jesus Christ reveals the God of Hosea. The God revealed in Jesus Christ reveals the relentless pursuit of a God who is love itself. A God that is committed to you, whoever you are, whatever you've done, whatever you will do. The God who has not abandoned humanity nor his creation. The God who is at work making all things new in Jesus Christ. This is the God of Hosea. The God who calls not my people, my people. And the God who pursues and grabs hold of those who are not loved and embraces them and calls them my beloved. This is the God who is not calling you into some empty religion or theological certainty or some obscured moral principles that you can follow in order to have a better life. This is a God who is calling you to nothing short than himself. who's given himself to you in the cross and who is giving himself to you right now in and by his spirit. And so for all of us, regardless of where we're at theologically, regardless of whether we're here exploring Jesus or whether we've been following Jesus for years, can I make this claim with a large amount of certainty before you all today? Because I am deeply convinced of it and I'm staking my life on it being true. The work of God is God's alone, and we are merely caught up in it. This, my friends, is grace. The God of love has brought you here into his presence this morning because he deeply loves you and actually really wants to know you, and more importantly, wants you to know him. Your work then is not to make God love you. Your work is to respond to the God who has loved you from the beginning of creation.